Today, we have two anniversaries that I want to mention, and I think uh, uh, Tony and Linda Travis were in the other service, but they are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and we congratulate them this morning. <clears throat> Harvey and Ada Burris cannot be here today, but we send them a, a television greeting from our church family, 72nd anniversary. And so we say congratulations to both of those families. Take your Bible and turn this morning to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. At the end of our service today, we have some beloved young parents who are going to dedicate their children to the Lord. And I'm thankful for these parents, and I'm thankful for the way that they love their children. And I'm thankful to you as a church family in doing everything that you can to come along beside of them and pray for them and support them and provide opportunities for them and their children to grow in the Lord. I don't know of another church that has invested in young families like you have. And I just want you to know that I'm proud of you. And I thank you for the investment that you're making in our young families. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. But I'm afraid as a nation that we have lost sight of the value of our children. When you stop and think that we have aborted over 50 million children in this nation since 1973, it's a frightening commentary on the way we devalue our children and devalue the sanctity of human life itself. That's something that absolutely ought not be. We ought to value these little boys and girls. God does. Amen? And we're to invest in our children by teaching them and training them to live according to the principles of the Bible. In Proverbs 23, the Bible says, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. The interesting thing is, the Bible not only refers to children as a heritage, the Bible refers to children as a weapon. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about your children being weapons? And yet that's exactly what the Bible says. It says that children are like arrows. Now an arrow is a weapon. Have you ever thought about this? Who is going to stand and fight the Lord's battles against the devil if we do not raise our children up according to the nurture and admonition of the Lord? They are weapons. And whenever God wanted to do something great, He brought a little baby into the world. Moses, Samuel, Ruth, David, Jesus. Children are God's gifts to us, but raising children is a great responsibility. So today we're looking at what I believe to be the most important lesson that you can teach your children. One of the most important lessons that all of us can ever learn. We're looking today at hearing God speak. One of the greatest things that you can do, mom, dad, is to teach your child while he or she is small how to recognize the voice of God. How to know when God is speaking to them. That's a lesson that's so important because if you get this one right, it builds a foundation that will help you for the rest of your life. Now a lot of times... People very casually say, and maybe you've said this, well, the Lord told me so and so. Or the Lord said for me to do this. Now I believe the Bible teaches us that God speaks to people. But I don't think that we are as careful as we ought to be when we say the Lord has said this and the Lord has said that. We need to make sure it is the Lord doing the talking before we say something like that. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, that we are to test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. 
How do we know it is God speaking and not the voice of the evil one trying to confuse us? How is it that we can come to discern the voice of God and know that we are hearing God speak and know that God is leading us in a particular direction? The most important thing a parent can teach a child is how to hear God speak, to learn to recognize God's voice, to know undoubtedly when God is leading and when God is not. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this little parable that we're going to look at this morning in Matthew chapter 7. If you'll stand with me to honor Him and to thank Him for His inerrant Word. We're looking at just a few verses. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, hearing God speak. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, The floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Listening to God, hearing His voice, integrating His Word into our value system, our our thinking and our attitudes and behavior, and teaching our children how to do that is essential for living the Christian life. Parents, listen. Grandparents, There is not a greater thing you can do than teach your children how to recognize and hear the voice of holy God. And in order to teach them, you have to know how to do that. And that's what we're looking at today. Let's pray together. Lord, bless our time in your word. Take your word and plant it deep in our minds and our hearts that today we can begin a journey together as the people of God listening, longing to hear, knowing how to hear the voice of God. Oh God, we want to follow you as we raise our children and our grandchildren. We want to hear your voice speak, and we pray you teach us how today. In the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Keep your Bible open before you. We're going to look at this little parable. There are three principles. Three principles from this parable that teach us about hearing God speak. Look at verse 24. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them. Now, here we find the steps to hearing God. If you get this one right, everything else will fall in line. Here are the steps to hearing God. There are two steps that he mentions here. Look at what he said, verse 24. Whoever hears, underline that word hears. Whoever hears the sayings of mine, you cannot hear until you listen. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody else and you knew they were not really listening to you? I mean, you were having that conversation and and they were looking at their watch or, or they were yawning or they seemed to be zoned out. And you just knew that you were talking and what you were talking about was not very important to them. They just, they were, they were listening, but they weren't really engaged. It was not sinking in. They were somewhere else. Well, a lot of people are like that when it comes to hearing God speak. They're, they're not really listening. They're not really interested. They may be hearing, but they're not listening. And so the first step to hearing God is to listen. And look at this word in verse 24. The word hears is translated from the word akuo. And that's a very powerful word. Here's what it literally means. It means to consider and to comprehend. So now look at what Jesus said. Verse 24. Whoever considers 
and comprehends these sayings of mine. That's what it means to listen. It means more than just passive listening. It is aggressive listening where you are considering what God is saying. You are meditating on it. You are thinking about it. And then you begin to comprehend it. You let it become a part of you. Jesus said, whoever hears, whoever listens, akuo, whoever considers it with great uh, meditation and then comprehends it and makes it part of their life. It's that kind of listening. Active listening, listening with intensity, a desire to hear God, a desire to understand what God is saying. That's the first step to hearing God. We're to listen. If you understand, say amen. Then look again at verse 24. Jesus said, whoever hears, whoever considers and comprehends these sayings of mine and does them. Underline the word does. It's not enough to consider. It's not enough to comprehend. Jesus said we have to go to the next step. And here he says we must obey. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. That's obedience. The purpose of God's Word is to help us to hear God speak so that we can live the way God wants us to live. So that we can train our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that they can live the way that God wants them to live. Jot down Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. Let me read it to you. Psalm 19, 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's the Word of God. The Word of God is perfect. You know why it's perfect? Because God is perfect. And He wrote it. It's His Word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Build the Word of God into your children. In Colossians 3.16, the Bible says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. And the word dwell has behind it the idea of permanence. Let the word of Christ be a permanent part of your everyday life. There should not be a day that you're not building the word of God into the heart and mind of your children so that you can help them understand what God is saying. Moms, dads, I want you to listen carefully. This is the reason why you hear me over and over and over again encourage you to have a family altar in your home. Every family ought to have a family altar. A time when you come together and you open the Bible every day with your family and you read a portion of the Word of God and you talk about what it means and you talk to your children about what it means and you put them in various situations that you know they're going to encounter in life and you teach them God's principles and say, now what does God say about this? So somewhere down the road when they face that situation, immediately the Spirit of God will bring to their heart and mind exactly the way they are to respond because you have taught them that from the Word of God. You have listened and now you're teaching your children to obey. Does that make sense to you? Amen? Well, that's how we're to do this. We obey the Word of God. I can still remember the old home life magazines that had daily devotions in the back of them. Anybody else remember that? There's a few old folks around here. (laughs) And when we were little kids, we would sit at the the counter, the breakfast counter, on bar stools there, and mother and daddy, every day, it'd be somebody's turn to read the home life devotion after we ate breakfast. And they taught us not only to listen, to consider, and comprehend, but to obey the Word of God. That's the first step to hearing God. But not only do we see the steps to hearing God, look at verse 25, and there's a second principle. Jesus said, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. Now, Jesus didn't say, If the rains descend, if the floods come, if The winds blow and beat on the house. Jesus said the rain descended. The floods came. 
The winds blew. He's talking here about the necessity of hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to learn to hear God speak because trials in our life are inevitable. They're going to come. You're going to face trials in your life. None of us are exempt from trouble. They're inevitable. There are family trials and, and financial trials and health trials and all kinds of trials come our way and they come when we're young and they come when we're old and we need to put our roots deep down in the Word of God and teach our children to do that while they are small so that they can consider the Word of God and comprehend the Word of God and obey the Word of God. And then when these inevitable trials come, their roots are so deep that they're not living by circumstances in fear, but they are facing the trials by faith and a living God who can get them through those trials. Amen? Amen? Trials are inevitable. That's the necessity of, of hearing God. But trials are also uncontrollable. Have you ever been driving in a, in a rainstorm and suddenly a torrential downpour and, and you couldn't see how to drive and you had to pull off the road? just came suddenly. All of us have seen on TV lately pictures of homes being washed away and Buildings crumbling and mountainsides shifting because of tsunamis and, and floods. And life is like that. There are circumstances that we're going to face in this life that are simply, absolutely beyond our control. They come out of nowhere. They blindside us when we least expect it. And that's when we're going to know that we have been listening to God and our roots are deep in the Word of God. And when these uncontrollable trials come our way, we just stand there and say, I'm trusting the Lord God to get me through these trials in my life. It is upon His Word and upon His promises I stand. That's, that's why it's important to hear God. The necessity of, of hearing God speak. We, we sing that great song, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that Jesus Christ is the solid rock and all other ground is sinking sand. It's Christ alone on the rock I stand. All listen. Parents, build your children on the solid rock. Build your children on Jesus Christ. And then there's a third principle that we see as we finish today. We see the blessings of hearing God. The blessings of, of hearing God. And, and there are three that we notice in these closing verses of, of this parable. Look at verse 25. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. That's endurance. That's endurance. Today, if you will teach your child how to hear and recognize the voice of God, you're teaching that child to endure whatever life may throw at them, whatever comes their way, they will be able to endure. But not only that, we see in this parable enjoyment. If we listen to God, if we obey God, we will have the capacity to really enjoy life because life, you know, if you, if you live by circumstances, if you live by happenstance, if you live by what comes your way, you're going to be disappointed. But if you live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to enjoy life no matter what comes your way. Because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that word abundant means full and meaningful. He's not talking about happiness. He's talking about a joy that exceeds our happiness regardless of the circumstances. He's saying, listen, when you build your life into the Word of God, you're going to have a life of joy, unspeakable and full of glory because you're not looking around at all these worldly things to make you happy. You found happiness in Jesus Christ. I mean, listen, if you want to really enjoy life 
and you don't know the Lord Jesus today, you need to humble yourself and turn from your sin and give your life to Christ, and you will find out for the first time in your life what real joy is all about. I can tell you, I've had eight funerals since the 1st of January, and I can tell you this, when you get to the end of your life and, and, and you're ready to go, it's not going to make one bit of difference how much money you made, what kind of car you drove, what kind of house you lived in, what kind of clothes you wore, how many degrees you have on the wall, what kind of prestige you have, where you work. You know what's going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? It's all that matters. And don't you let the devil deceive you into thinking you've got plenty of time. You need to, to get right with him today. You need to open your heart and life to Christ today. There is enjoyment in knowing Jesus. And then there is enrichment we see here. You see, this man that built his house upon a rock, he enriches us today. He is an encouragement to us today. We're reading about him today. He teaches us how to live. And when you and I make up our mind to hear God speak, to really hear God speak, to, to plant our roots deep in the Word of God and teach our children how to, how to do that, how to hear the voice of God when He speaks. We're giving them something in life that they'll carry with them forever and they will enrich everybody around them. The testimony. Why is it? Why is it that two people can go through the very same trial and one falls apart and the other's faith is never shaken? It is because they built their house on the rock. They built their house on the rock that living by faith and not by sight. They're not looking at their circumstances. They're looking at the King over their circumstances, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way to live. And when you live like that, it's infectious. When you live like that, you enrich the lives of others around you. One of my favorite prophets in Scripture is Elijah. Elijah had a tremendous impact on the entire nation because he listened to God, because he obeyed God. Elijah confronted pagan kings and queens. Elijah raised the dead. Elijah encouraged the heartbroken. Elijah boldly encountered the false prophets. Everywhere this man went, he made a difference for God. But do you know in the book of James in the New Testament, the Bible says Elijah was just like you and me. He had the same nature we have. And do you know in Kings, the Bible says there was a time in the life of Elijah when he got discouraged and he got depressed and he got down and out. He wanted to die. He prayed to die. He was so discouraged that here was this prophet of God and he, he was praying to die. And so God sent him to Mount Horeb. He traveled almost six weeks to get to that mountain. It was in the, the same place years earlier, that very place that Moses encountered God in the burning bush. It was at that same place. And God spoke to Moses. And you remember what God said, I am. I want to tell you something. When you've had it up to here, all you need to hear is God say, I am. And that's enough. That's all you need for God just to come in. And say, I am. Well, Elijah went up to Mount Horeb so he could hear God speak. And the Bible says there came an earthquake. And there came a, a great fire. And then there came a, a mighty rushing wind. And God did not speak in the earthquake. God did not speak in the fire. God did not speak in the wind. Elijah sitting at the mouth of a cave and he felt a gentle breeze and in that gentle breeze he heard the still small voice of God Elijah Elijah I am Elijah God spoke in a still, small 
voice. And old Elijah was revived. You may be like Elijah this morning. You may be wearied. You may be worried. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm getting ready to say. The answer is not found in the noise and the rumble of this world. Seldom do we hear God speak in the rush of the office or the clatter of friends. God is saying to you and to me this morning what he said to the psalmist, what he said to Elijah, be still, be still, and know that I am God. The key to being still makes all the difference. When we're still, the sad heart is cheered. When we're still, the confused mind is settled. When we're still, the lonely spirit is befriended. When we're still, the rebellious heart is subdued. You know, when Jesus taught, he had a favorite saying. He always used to say, He who has ears, let him hear. That was Jesus' way of saying, listen, obey. It was good advice then, and it's good advice today. Young parents, listen, obey. Teach your children to hear God speak. And you are giving them an eternal foundation that will weather the storms of this world. Everything around us pales in comparison to knowing that we've heard God speak. No trouble, no trial, no circumstance, no uncertainty can ever displace the wonderful peace that God puts in our heart when we know that we've heard Him speak. I want you to stand with me. In this room, over in the contemporary service, I want you to stand with me too. and uh, I want you to keep me on for a minute over there for this invitation. I want to ask you to bow your heads all across the room. Now, our invitation is going to be a little different today. I want to ask the parents who are dedicating their children to step out right now and come forward. All the parents... Just step out and come forward across the front here. Those of you in the contemporary service, I want you to begin to pray for these parents. Just bow your heads and begin to pray. Church family in this auditorium, I want you to do the same. Just bow your heads and begin to pray. And I'm going to ask some people just to step out of the congregation. Family members, deacons, Sunday school teachers, friends. Let's have somebody come and stand with every one of these couples and just pray with them right now. Come on, right now. Just come right on. Somebody just pick out one of these couples and stand with them and pray with them. Every couple. I want somebody to pray with every couple. Come on. If you need somebody, raise your hand and we'll get you somebody. Everybody's got somebody to pray with them.